Well, I was surprised that uh, Paul Brandon was called Custer, as everyone knows that he would have been on the side of the Native Americans. You know, <laughs> um, I want to say the question of, of benefits is an important issue. I mean, we know that what's going on here is a fundamental attack upon hundreds of thousands of working class people, and at a particularly brutal period. I mean, what's happening here is people being bullied off benefits at a time when the jobs don't exist anyway, that they can even pretend that people could go to. They're being bullied off benefits as non-existent jobs. And already, very nasty attacks have gone through. The Employment Support Allowance, for example, which can affect a million working class people, now means that you get £60.50 for the first 13 weeks before, and then you have to search for a job, only then having proved that you're sufficiently disabled, will you then get the princely sum of £102. That's an immense attack upon working class people, and it is a disgrace and a shame of the Labour government that for all the talk of looking after ordinary people that it's attempting to push through those things. And of course that's precisely the issues that the trade union movement should be fighting about, not simply the narrow questions of one particular group of workers, but over those wider issues. Because if you have a society in which it hangs over people, if you not only will you lose your job, but you'll be thrown into complete poverty, that also is a factor in determining working class consciousness. So it's very important we raise demands, for example, like that if workers are unemployed, they remain members of the union. The union should re remove their membership fees, but they should remain members of the union and should be part of organising inside the working class. And we should look for opportunities of thinking about how we can, not so much I don't think put it as saying, organise the unemployed, but organise the employed and the unemployed together. This was always the most effective form of working amongst, un, amongst unemployed people, that you have the bringing together of unemployed workers, going to workers and, and employed who are facing closures, for example, and arguing against those closures. That the high points of the Right to Work campaign in the 1980s was precisely that, to try and bring together a fight back over unemployment together with workers who have the power to actually stop people becoming unemployed in the first place. This is a very important area of work that we'll have to continue with. See, the question of wages, I think it's quite important to say, of course in terms of the big set piece battle of the unity of the public sector workers and so on, there's been a big reverse around that. It doesn't mean the question of wages has gone away. It clearly hasn't gone away on the London buses. Very, very important that that goes on. Or on the buses in Aberdeen or in North East Scotland, for example, where there are big strikes over pay. There may be other strikes over that. And it may well become that even at a time where inflation falls, that people still want to fight to maintain their living standards. It's not unreasonable that people don't accept that they should see cuts in their living standards just because there's a crisis for the bosses' system. And so, you know, I don't rule out at all the continuation of the possibility of actions about this. I'm not pessimistic about whether there's this mood inside the working class, not at all. But I do recognise there's an immense political battle that's going to go on here. It's very important that people are ready for it. I mean, think of the example of JCB. JCB, they come to the workers and they say, either you can choose 500 job losses or 120 job losses and 50 quid a week wage cut. And the union says to them, come on, social solidarity, let's accept just 120 job losses and the 50 pounds a week pay cut. And then three weeks later, they come back and say, we're having the 500 anyway. But you can still have the 50 pound a week wage cut. Now that is, you know, a huge, you, you, you don't want too many of them to be honest at the moment. And that's a political battle. It's a political battle that's going on inside the trade union movement. And it's going on inside every level of the working class. And it's, I'll tell you, it's one of the reasons why the American government would be much less quick to bail out GM, Chrysler and Ford than they were in the banks. Because it's a very dangerous thing to do. The price of them giving money to GM, Chrysler and Ford will be mass redundancies. I guarantee it will be mass redundancies, getting rid of the health schemes and so on. Because it's very dangerous. Once you get a notion that the government can say, we'll stop redundancies, we'll bail the money out and so on, why is it just GM, Chrysler and Ford? Why isn't it every company across the American economy? We know half a million people in America were thrown on the dole last month. In the month of November alone, 500,000 more went on the dole queue. It's very dangerous for any government to start saying we'll give money to make sure people's jobs are safe, which is why Brown always says we can't stop people losing their jobs, but we will retrain them to enable them to get another job. Because it would be incredibly dangerous for the government.
to be seen to be forced to do this because everyone else would then begin to do it. Now we have to make sure that we get the example, that we get the example where they are forced to guarantee people's jobs and in the process then of course raising the argument that they need to take the factories and the offices away from those who have made the redundancies in the first place. And once you get a few examples like that, it would spread like wildfire. It would spread like wildfire because the example would be there of the possibility of stopping them doing it and of getting, forcing the government to intervene and if these people won't guarantee jobs then take the factories and the offices away from them. That's a big political question but it's also a question where the examples of success are important. So even the small ones we need to publicise but we need more of them and we need bigger ones as well and that's the role of socialists is part of, uh, of the process to do that because Leon Trotsky also said an idea that seizes the, 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 the masses itself becomes a material factor. The ideas in people's heads, once they begin to change, begin to change the objective realities in which the working class struggle takes place. And I'll finish on this. We need to be at the centre of every possible resistance. And most of the time, it may not happen. Most of the time, we won't win in every argument. But the ones that we do win are incredibly important. That's what political leadership is about. It's about every person in a workplace, and it's about organisations as well. Which is why you do need a bigger socialist organisation. You need more people who know that it's the boss's system that it's at fault. That it's not simply about a few bankers, but it's about the way the whole system is organised. You need more people who are arguing for unity across the working class. Black and white together, women and men together, gay and straight together. You need more people who are not constrained simply by the limits of their trade union, but argue for the interests across the whole of the working class. You need more people who have a vision of a different sort of society where the rule of profit is abolished and human need comes first rather than the interests of a tiny minority. If you have that, then you have the possibility of not simply raising the level of resistance, but of making sure that what comes out of this crisis is a fight against the system that produced it in the first place. And that's why we need more people in the SWP.